Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our January Talk to Talk. We are so excited as we have celebrated Dr. King's birthday uh, in the last week and as we prepare for the bridge from that day to Absalom, the Feast of Absalom Jones and Black History Month and of course to um, our film that will happen this week, uh, The Case for Love. And today we are deeply honored uh, to have as our speaker, uh, Father Germond Taylor, uh, who is the rector of St. Ambrose Episcopal Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he has served since 2012. Father Taylor is probably one of the most creative uh, priest, young, younger priest uh, in the church uh, today. Um, he brings a passion for justice, uh, a passion for liturgical renewal uh, with an emphasis on Black American and African culture through the Ethiopian Orthodox icons at Stations of the Cross. Icons and kneelers of Black Episcopal saints, the Episcopal service music based on spirituals, and a jazz mass. He has a fabulous uh, jazz set of musicians who not only play at St. Ambrose, but travel all over the country and are in demand. St. Ambrose also birthed the environmental justice movement in Southeast Raleigh in the 1990s by responding to community flooding. In 2022, Father Taylor received Sewanee School of Theology Award for Service and the Lilly Endowment Clergy Renewal Sabbatical Grant. He chairs Raleigh's Storm Maker Commission, uh, managing its $13 million budget. He is married to Kirsten Taylor, and they have two young children. And he is uh, a supporter and encourager of, of congregational development and of clergy as they grow in the spirit he is a theologian, he is a man of God, he is a fun guy with a sense of humor, um, and a serious, serious man of God. We welcome him today, and after our opening prayer, uh, he will be the next voice you hear. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, in the dreams that we have deferred, in the hopes that we have lost, in the longings that we have released, we pray, hold us close, carry us on, and set us free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father Taylor. Thank you so much, Dean Wilson. Before I jump in, is, will it be possible to share my screen? Uh, it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I don't know if that can be enabled because <clears throat> I do have a, a few images. And so, there we go. So I should, I'm good to go now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, greetings, UBE. Honored to, to be with you this evening, afternoon, evening. I also want to do a time check. Um, how much time do I have and what time do you want me to wrap up, Dean, Dean Wilson? Uh, you have about 40 minutes, and we'd like you to wrap up at about uh, 440 or so, so okay. that uh, President Coleman can come on and remind us of something exciting happening this week. Fantastic. Always good thank to you. time time check. Great. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. And again, honored uh, to be with UBE. Um, this is an important ministry in the church. Um, over over a century, a years old, and so um, God, thank you, or I'm grateful for the invitation to talk with you this evening. Um, when Dean Wilson uh, asked me for a topic, I said the topic of the ring of freedom, the ring of freedom from Blessed Absalom Jones to Blessed Martin Luther King Jr. I want to start by playing a clip that we have all seen several times. I'm sure that um, some on the Zoom call were even on the Washington Mall uh, the day 
that this famous speech happened. So let me put, play that clip right now for our hearing. Let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside. Let freedom ring and we can have When we allow freedom ring. When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet. From every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. We, are free. we all know that speech well. Uh, this time of year, it gets played over and over again. I once heard Reverend Dr. Michael Eric Dyson say that Fraction is sabbatical from the dream speech because when this time of year comes, people um, distill Dr. King down to a dream. And granted, he did, had a, he did have a dream, and yet he was so much more than the dream. Uh, the genius of that speech is that he took something that's very much what we might call traditional American uh, from that, that hymn, My Country, Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, of Thee I Sing, Let Freedom Ring. And he took it and put it in the context of the civil rights movement, the modern day civil rights movement. And he framed it and said, the sound of freedom needs to ring all across these United States. And he did not place it in the Liberty Bell only but said this resounding sound of freedom must be heard all over the country. And the evidence of that will be justice for all. As he said, if America is to be a great nation, we must live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people are created equal. So when we talk about the ring of freedom, I want to talk and begin with the sound. When Dr. King was giving his I Have a Dream speech and playing off this image of letting freedom ring, having thoughts of the Liberty Bell, he was concentrating on sound. We know that sound is uh, frequency in motion, uh, frequency in air and through other medium. And Blessed Absalom Jones also uh, spoke about this issue of sound in his perhaps most famous speech, giving on um, January 1, New Year's Day, 1808, at St. Thomas African Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. He gave a Thanksgiving sermon for the end of the slave trade, uh, the legal slave trade in these United States. And this is what uh, Blessed Absalom Jones had to say. Painful and distressing as these sufferings were, they constituted the smallest part of their misery, while the fields resounded with their cries in the day. Their huts and hamlets were vocal at night with their lamentations over their sons, who were dragged from their arms of their mothers and put to death by drowning in order to prevent such an increase in their population as to endanger the safety of the state by an insurrection. What Blessed Absalom Jones is talking about as he began his 1808 sermon is the sounds heard from those enslaved Africans in the fields, the cries for freedom, uh, not only the cries for freedom in the fields, but also 
their cries of freedom and lament from their huts and from their hamlets at, at night on their, their night bed or night cot or just on the ground with lamentations of their sons who were and daughters who were dragged from their mother's arm and put to death by drowning. Uh, Absalom Jones begins his Thanksgiving sermon in that context. He also goes on to talk about not only the drowning of Africans as he began his sermon, but also uh, later in his sermon, looking at those who wanted or decided that it was better to drown in the ocean on the slave ship than it was to endure the slave ship and then be enslaved in these United States, choosing what he called a watery grave as opposed to being under the yoke of the oppressor in the United States or in the Western Hemisphere. So the Ring of Freedom is not only that which is the sound of the Liberty Bell, but also the sound, as Absalom Jones would say, of those who chose a watery grave. We know from science that sound travels faster through water. It travels faster through liquid. It travels faster through metal and through ground. And so by there, uh, the enslaved, our ancestors choosing a watery grave of, of the Atlantic uh, or the Caribbean over being under uh, the yoke of oppression in these United States was a sound of freedom um, entering into a body that in some ways, if we use our imagination, would allow their voice to travel back to the United States. I think about the... Um, report given of the enslaved in, on the Gullah uh, there in Georgia and South Carolina, who once they reached these shores, shores, decided that they would march on the ocean floor back to Africa. And they marched into the water, the sound of their uh, feet displacing water, the splashing, getting in the water, their sound, because water has that medium of allowing sound to travel farther in their minds going back to Mother Africa, choosing that sound over the sound of shackles and of oppression. So what Absalom Jones did as he looked at uh, this sound of oppression is that he put sound into action. And we see an early sign of this from the work that he did with the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. We know that in, in 1793, uh, the yellow fever epidemic um, went quickly through Philadelphia. At that time, Philadelphia was the nation's capital and all of the elected officials uh, from President George Washington to Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson fled Philadelphia for the yellow fever in order to uh, seek better grounds in the rural areas. It's almost unimaginable. It would be like today, this day and age, if the president and secretary of state and all the cabinet were to abandon Washington, D.C. and their duties there and go to Colorado or go somewhere underground. And in their doing, they left the work of burying and carrying for the people who suffered from yellow fever to our ancestors, those of African descent. Uh, one of the things that we can see uh, from this map of, of Philadelphia is the belief was that uh, our African ancestors who were in the Caribbean, particularly French speaking uh, colonies who came to Philadelphia were the bearers of yellow fever. Today, we would say that is fake news and alternative facts. The belief also was that uh, black people were somehow immune to yellow fever. If you think, of, you think back to the early days of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was a belief that some people were immune and other, others weren't. And it was in that context that uh, Blessed Absalom Jones and the Free African Society uh, began to respond, uh, one, by disputing these uh, alternative facts and fake news, by saying that black people were dying at the same rate uh, as white people, um, that, the, that there, there was no difference, that black people were not somehow immune 
um, and also caring for those in need. And so the sound of freedom, as it related to Absalom Jones and those in the Free African Society, uh, was not uh, dedicated to voice only, but their sound manifested itself in work, in works of helping others, of making sure that the dead were buried, both black and white, that there were carriage drivers, that there were nurses to take care of those who were sick, that there were people to open their homes, to take care of the orphan, those children whose parents had died and had no parents. All of that was done by Absalom Jones. So the ring of freedom in his context might have been the resounding of the cries of, of those who were enslaved, as he put it, but also that he uh, uh, led a movement to make a difference, certainly in Philadelphia, during the yellow fever pandemic. We can then pivot to blessed Martin Luther King Jr. who, when you think about the ring of freedom in his context, uh, I, don't, I don't think so much about uh, water as it relates to, to blessed King, uh, but actually the sound of voice, that the, the preached word, the spoken word uh, for Dr. King was really the ring of freedom. You can think about the tenor of his voice, what he said, the creativity, the use of media. One of the things that I do each year in preparing for uh, Blessed King is I try to read a new book. And some years ago, I read a book um, that talked about uh, the spiritual life and prayer life of Dr. King. The whole book comprised the prayers that Dr. King wrote. And I found it interesting that as a young minister in Atlanta, he used technology as a way to spread the gospel. So as he was coming along, obviously no, no computers, certainly no social media, but there was radio. But there were not a lot of black people on radio, certainly not a lot of black ministers. And what Blessed King did is that he used this new medium of radio as a way to get his message out to the larger community, forward thinking uh, in, in, in that respect. Um, he used his voice as a clarion call to, to mobilize people, um, to pull together uh, a group of folk whose feet on the ground changed the world, embodying the teachings of Gandhi and Bayard Rustin, of his professors at Morehouse, uh, the nonviolence movement, uh, which is not a pacifist movement, but a nonviolent movement as a way to arm yourself, not with AR or style rifles or guns, but to arm yourself with love. And the radical nature with which Dr. King spoke and wrote is often missed this time of year because as I said in my opening remarks, well, people distill King to the I have a dream speech. Um, what we see that as King aged and matured, remember that he was only assassinated at 39, such a young man, um, that there was very little daylight between him and Malcolm X. You read his book about community, uh, where should we go from here, community or chaos? He really lays out uh, a plan for America, a plan for black people, how we can live together. And really his early work was about reform um, in a constitutional context. And he really began to abandon that and say, if we wanna be true to what we say, we must do something differently. So the, the ring of sound. Uh, the second ring of freedom, the type of ring of freedom I wanna talk about is the ring of curvature. Uh, many of us uh, wear jewelry. It could be a ring on, on the hand, like I have a ring on my hand. People might wear rings on their hands or uh, ears. Uh, ring is, is typically um, curved, curved, and what makes a ring, most rings um, consistent, is that it rings have constant curvature. That's how it becomes a circle. Um, a ring is a, a, a piece of metal or jewelry that has constant curvature, that has constant angles, and when that continues, it forms a circle, 
and there is no beginning, there is no end. So one way to think about the ring of freedom is in the context of an arc. We all know, Dr. King would say, the moral arc of the universe is long and bends toward justice. The moral arc of the universe is long and it bends toward justice. If you keep bending that moral arc, you will get a ring. The ultimate goal, as King saw it, uh, was to have uh, really an, an infinite ring of freedom that uh, no matter your background, no matter where you came from, no matter where you are going, that you will uh, be seen as a child of God. And of course, sit-ins were used to that effort. Um, also, um, protest, um, also nonviolent movement. When we think about the, the, the ring of freedom from a constant curvature or the arc of the moral universe bringing towards justice, one way we can think about that with Blessed Absalom Jones um, is with this Thanksgiving sermon that I opened with. Um, Blessed Absalom Jones in January 1st, New Year's Day of 1808, was enthusiastic. He saw the Holy Spirit moving through the halls of Congress to pass the prohibition of the slave trade in the Atlantic. I don't know about you, but I really can't point to a time when, recently when I can say that the Holy Spirit has moved through the halls of the Congress. Um, and yet, blessed Absalom Jones, when you read his speech and the hymn that followed, the hymn that follows his speech was a hymn written by the musician, the minister of music at St. Thomas Church on occasion of the prohibition of the slave trade in these United States. And so as you read his sermon, he sees this, this, that God is moving, just like God moved through the Old Testament and Exodus and freeing the Hebrew people under the yoke of oppression and slavery, that God was moving in a similar way through uh, the laws of these United States, uh, bending this moral arc. And he eventually saw, although he did not live to see, uh, the end of slavery, uh, or chattel slavery, I'll say in 1865, although I would argue vestiges still exist, particularly around prison system and penal system. But to that point, he would, if Absalom Jones were still living in 1865, he would argue that the same moral arc that led the Congress to dissolve the, the slave trade in the Atlantic in 1808 was the same moral arc that led to the end of slavery with the 13th Amendment in 1865, is the same moral arc that exists today when people and organizations like UBE continue to fight for justice and peace and equality. The third type of the ring of freedom I want to talk about relates to the ring or circle around saints. We often see a ring or circle around saints. And this is no different. You see Blessed Absalom Jones uh, in this religious icon. He has a ring around his head. Now, some people call that a halo, but that's a misnomer. A halo is what we have over angels, um, chiefly a circle that is directly over an angel's head. The type of circle that we see in this type of iconography and is popular in all Christian iconography is called a nimbus. Nimbus is a Latin word for cloud. And the reason we see the nimbus on or behind the heads of saints is for a number of reasons. One, uh, we can say that for almost every religious occurrence, there is a practical meaning. So when you see the sun eclipsed, as we do in this image, you see the moon is in front of the sun, but you see the ring around the outer edge of the sun. In like manner, if we also were to look at the moon, you can see the moon in the center with Venus, the planet Venus there to the left, and then there is a larger ring around it. And so the reason we have these rings or, or nimbi or the nimbus on these religious icons is that it reminds us that the person who is sainted 
is a shining light implying great dignity. That just like in the eclipse of the moon and the sun, the moon moves in front of the sun, we see only the ring around the sun, that the people we lift up at, as saints are the same way. That their shining light implies great dignity, that their, low, that their glow uh, brings about them a ring. And that ring symbolizes God's glory. Now, there's an inter interesting aspect of God's glory. People use God's glory a lot. And I always wonder, do people really understand what they say when they use God's glory? If we look back to the Hebrew people, they saw glory as the manifestation of God's goodness. They knew that they could not see God, but they could see the evidence of God. So the glory of God is the evidence of God. When we read in scripture that the earth is full of God's glory, we can replace it by saying the, the earth is full of the evidence of the goodness of God. And so the Hebrew people saw God's glory as they were moving out of, of Egypt with the uh, pillar of fire and the, the, the cloud that would, would lead and guide them. They saw God's glory in the parting of the Red Sea. They saw God's glory in the manna that rained from heaven, the quail, the moving into the land of promise in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. People saw God's glory in the manifestation of Jesus Christ, that this is God visible to us in the healing of people, giving sight to the blind, raising people from the dead, and then ultimately his resurrection and ascension. All of these are signs of God's glory, the evidence. We could think about the fingerprints, the footprints that God was here. So when we talk about uh, the nimbus behind the icon of blessed Absalom Jones, uh, I could also show an image of the icon of blessed Martin. I would do that as well, just for continuity's sake, just to make sure we can see that. Uh, the icon of blessed Martin, again, the nimbus, the, the sun, the, the shining light behind his head. We say that's God's glory. And so when we say that about these two individuals, St. Absalom Jones, St. Martin Luther King Jr., is that their lives are imprinted with the evidence that the Holy Spirit moved in their way, in their lives in a very dynamic way. Where do we begin with that? First, we have to begin with their relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, beginning, of course, in their baptism. Think about Blessed Absalom Jones. Uh, both baptized in the Episcopal Church, married in the Episcopal Church as an enslaved African, moving to Philadelphia, um, uh, helping found the Free African Society, worshiping at a Methodist church, and then uh, being forced out of that church to found St. Thomas African Episcopal Church, the first Black Episcopal Church in the United States and the first Black church in Philadelphia. Absalom Jones does not do that on his own. It is the work of the Holy Spirit living within him. It, it comes from a place of, of deep spirituality, of prayer to God, of walking with God, of trusting in God. The same is true for, for Blessed Martin Luther King Jr. I remember reading uh, in a book, uh, in actually Dr. King's um, autobiography, where he spoke about the early days of being in, in um, uh, the boycott uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. And he was 27 years old. Um, they were in the boycott and he received a phone call that said within three days, they were going to bomb his house and then blow his brains out. And then the person hung up the phone. Dr. King said he sat down at the kitchen. He made a cup of coffee, sat down at the kitchen table and holding the cup of coffee in his hand. He never even drank the coffee, holding a cup of coffee in his hand. He prayed to God. He said, God, I'm scared. I cannot do this on my own. I'm standing in front of the people wanting to lead them. Yet I know that if I'm weak, they will falter. And I can't do this without your help. King said he began to have this deep feeling of peace of God telling him that it was going to be all right. And Dr. King said when he stood up from that table, he was a different person. Three days later, 
somebody did bomb his house. Now his wife Coretta and 10 week, get this, 10 week old Yolanda, 10 week old newborn, happened to be in the, in the back room when the people bombed the front of the house. Dr. King said when he received message that his house had been bombed, he still had that deep sense of peace. And when you talk about Dr. King and think about his ministry, you can really say it was that experience, that intimate experience of God around that kitchen table that opened him up to do the work that God had given him to do. Spirituality, relationship with God. So as we think about the ring of freedom, we think about the sound of freedom. What does the sound of freedom make? What sound does it make? It's more uh, than the Liberty Bell, which is cracked. Uh, we saw in Blessed Martin that it was a sound of feet marching, uh, the sound of speeching, speaking, the sound of singing, the sound of going to places uh, where at that time they thought ministers probably shouldn't go. Dr. King was great in billiards. He was a master on, on the pool hall. He would go to the pool hall, rack up the balls, play a game, and say, if I win, you better be at the mass meeting tomorrow. Oh, pastor, you can't beat me. He would beat them. And where would they be? They would be at the mass meeting the next day, uh, going to places uh, where, where, where people were in order to, to make sure that they could be involved in the movement. Um, the, the sound of freedom, uh, audibly, for Blessed Absalom Jones, uh, was the sound of water. Of, of people choosing, as he said, a, a watery grave over the yoke of oppression. And then those who uh, chose to make it, uh, to stay and make it to these shores, uh, the sound was the sound of cries growing out, uh, the sound of uh, being overworked and dehumanized in the field and the, those sounds being lifted to God and that those sounds be lifted to God from the context of Blessed Absalom Jones um, led to the moral arc of the universe slightly being bent toward justice, as you saw it in January 1, 1808, in the passing of um, the disillusion of the, the North Atlantic slave trade. And he would see that same ring, that, that circle, uh, a ring is, 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 is constant circle, constant arc. He would see that moving uh, directly into the disillusionment of slavery and the, with the 13th Amendment, and then on to the modern day civil rights movement. Dr. King saw that moral uh, arc of the universe bending toward justice in the work that he did, that he was just a small portion of, portion of the arc and that it would continue, uh, this bending of justice continue whenever people of goodwill gather together to, um, to build power, not oppressive power, which is power over people, but relational power, which is power among people, power among people and power with God. And then we think about the ring of freedom. We think about uh, the ring that is on the back of the heads of the saints, uh, the nimbus, the cloud, that ring being the sign of glory, that the shining light of the saint implies great dignity, that just as you can see this, the ring around the sun in an eclipse, um, that you have that same ring around the um, the blessed saints symbolizing God's glory, that their lives are examples of God's glory, not because uh, blessed Absalom Jones and blessed Martin Luther King Jr. did these things for themselves. They did them for the greater good. They were selfless in their work. They were not concerned about increasing bank accounts. I think about when Dr. King won the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, uh, the purse was some quarter million dollars. I think all of that money went directly to the civil rights movement. Uh, uh, if any, went into his pocket. I think about Blessed Absalom Jones and starting these businesses in Philadelphia, not to get rich, but to help funnel money into the free Africa society. Their work was around God's glory, giving glory to God, and was about justice. So as we think about this arc from Blessed Absalom Jones to Blessed Martin, I hope that we will think about the ring of freedom and more so than the Liberty Bell, but that we will use our voices to proclaim the, the good news of God's grace, that we will work together through organizing, 
to bring down unjust structures. Then we would think about the ring as in metal, either ring on, on finger or ring in ear, uh, ring that has this constant curvature, which is a constant arc that we will embody and live out that the moral arc of the universe is law and that it bends toward justice because God is on our side and that we will remember uh, the ring that surround the heads of our saints, that the nimbus shows God's glory and really live into the fact as the New Testament does and calls all of us saints. One of the things I love about the, the baptismal um, promises and baptism serves in the Episcopal Church is it has that line that we will welcome you into the priesthood of all believers, that through our baptisms, we become priests of God, that through our baptism, we become ministers of the gospel, and that we don't have to uh, die to be a saint, but as New Testament says, we're saints already because we are glory of God. We shine forth with God's love, and as um, Dean Wilson's grandmother would say, God don't make no junk. Thank you so much for your, for your attentiveness and time. I'm wrapping up with the 90 seconds to spare. And again, thank you. Dean Sandy, you're on mute. Thank you, Father Taylor. On behalf of all of us, we thank you for feeding us mightily today and for feeding us with deep thoughts that will carry us through this season um, to, to take what you've said and to pull it apart and to live with it and, and breathe through it will take some time. And so we thank you very, very much for the feeding. We will... Um, you know, this was beyond an excellent word, and uh, we give you thanks for your willingness to do it and for bringing us such wonderful feeding. We hope to reflect a little bit of what you said in the closing prayer, maybe, but right now uh, we would invite uh, President uh, Kim to come to us with a word about this week, and then we will pull ourselves together at the end with a prayer. President Kim. Thank you very much, Dean Sandy. And Father Jamon, it's been a while. And I'm telling you, been. thank you. <laughs> Baltimore, we had him as our guest preacher for one of yep. our services. And so yep. thankful to have you back with UBE, UBE again and bringing us that refreshing word. Oh, so much, so deep. And as you, Sandy President. has said, we are going to spend some time digesting that so that we can hear those sounds of today and let them move us into action. Exactly. I am particularly thankful for some of your summary words where you indicated that Absalom Jones and Martin Luther King Jr. both were selfless in their work. I say that because we are about to go to the movies on Tuesday. I hope by now all those who are on the line and those who are members and supporters of UBE have purchased their ticket to see A Case for Love, which is a documentary that has been put together under the leadership of Brian Idy, and they have uh, journeyed across this nation to collect stories of people who have been exercising selfless love to put to the test the teachings, the sermons, the conversations of our presiding Bishop Michael Bruce Curry on love. And love is the answer to all of the division, all the issues, all the whatever we're facing today. So you have just brought to light that these two individuals themselves were key examples of what selfless love in their work looks like. Now we get to go and see on Tuesday. It's only showing on Tuesday, folks. Don't wake up on Wednesday and think you're going to go see A Case for Love. All right? It's just Tuesday. So check out the website, A Case for Love. That's where you'll find the link to where you can go and to ordering your tickets 
Tickets are signed in advance. You might have to stand in a little line, but you do not have to fight over a seat. So please, I, I, oh, I ask you to not only go, but when you get there, find a spot where you might have a promo, uh, a, 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 a poster behind you, and take a picture and send that picture into UBE and send it to leadership at the ube.org. We're going to gather those pictures. We're going to make sure the national church, the church uh, uh, receives those pictures, and we're going to post them on our website to see how your voices and the sounds have stirred you into an action of learning more about selfless love and then applying it in the days and months that unfold for this year because we're going to need it in 2024. We need it always, but this this may very well be a tough year for believing in the power of selfless love. So we thank you so much for getting your ticket, for going, for attending, and we look forward to really hitting this uh, nation with our uh, presence to let them know that there are a mighty force of people who still believe in the power of selfless love. So thank you. I'll go back to Dean Sandy now and uh, ask you to continue with the closing of our program for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Kim. The Lord be with you. And also let us, let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we give you thanks for this time. We give you thanks for this preacher. We give you thanks for blessed Absalom and for blessed Martin. We give you thanks for the gift of sound and the sound that moves through the water. We give you thanks for the gift of curvature that can be found in the rings. We give you thanks for the nimbus that is around the heads of those whom we remember, pray for, and celebrate. And we give you thanks for the ark, the ark that stretches wide and long, the ark of the universe that always bends towards justice. May we be so mindful of this work that we never forget the foundation laid for us, the baton passed to us, the feet on the ground calling us to carry on the work begun, but not yet ended in you, O Lord. Begun with blessed Absalom, with the ark that continues to blessed Martin, and the ark that continues to all of us. May it be so. Amen. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. This ends our presentation, and we look forward to seeing you next month.